All right, in today's episode, we're going to talk about can you look like a bodybuilder without steroids? I don't know what it is. <laughs> I think the... Uh, we oh, there, a, was, there was a time when bodybuilders didn't even have access to steroids, Yeah, right? we need so, to define this because, to be very clear, we'll just say this early out right now, you yeah. cannot look like a bodybuilder. Ronnie like Coleman, a, yeah, it's not going to happen. No, you're not going to look like a pro bodybuilder today without taking steroids. But the good news is I don't think most people want to look like pro bodybuilders today. I think that's pretty rare, right? Yeah, but I also think it's important to know too that uh, even more so than steroids, that they're those are genetic anomalies. Oh, like big that, time! Yeah, I'm glad you said that. M- I mean, uh, and, and so people need to understand that, a, like, a, and you, I referred to Ronnie Coleman and the Flex Wheelers and some of these crazy physiques. A lot of people didn't realize or didn't see what they look like before they took steroids yeah mm-hmm. and they were crazy yeah. physiques and so yes anabolics enhanced that and made it even crazier and has raised the bar in the bodybuilding world to now where a majority if not all are on anabolics especially in the in the actual bodybuilding category i still think there's some men's physique athletes that compete at the highest level that are natural um, we have friends uh, that did at least up into uh, about two years ago were 100 percent natural on the Olympia stage in men's physique. Um, so there, it's very much so possible to have a physique that looks like that at that level of a bodybuilder competitor and be natural. It is not uh, the steroids no, that make them look I, like. I want to I want to define this a little better though because it, it's true though that the average person has no desire to. Look. I mean, the average person looks at a pro bodybuilder today, you know, five nine, two hundred eighty pounds with veins all over and the average person would say, I don't want to look like that. But if you took bodybuilders from the silver era of bodybuilding, this is like between the 1940s and 1960s. And yes, I know bodybuilding historians will say, well, there were steroids back then too. Uh, Most of them, or many of them didn't use them. And if they did, the doses were so, so, so low, they would actually be, they wouldn't even be considered testosterone replacement therapy. That's how low the anabolics were back then. But uh, they that those physiques are very achievable naturally, and if the average person looked at pictures of those people, I think they'd say, "Wow, that looks pretty amazing." Like Steve Reeves is a great example, right? V taper, great development, wide shoulders, strong muscular. Larry Scott, the first Mister Olympia, Sean Connery. I don't know if you guys knew this. He competed in oh, bodybuilding. Sean in Connery competed in bodybuilding in the in the silver era, and there's a picture of him posing or whatever. Oh, right? I gotta got, check that out. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, it's pretty pretty wild. <laughs> okay, that guy's my hero for yeah, sure. Clancy Ross is, a, is another one. You can look all these people up for yourself to kind of see what they look like. Um, and now, that is uh, very achievable through, um, you know, really consistent good training and diet and exercise, and we'll talk about that. Today's program giveaway, MAPS PED. That's our most advanced bodybuilder program. Super high volume, double split routine, only for those of you that are hardcore. Anyway, you can get that. That's what you got to do, though. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Now, everybody else, MAPS Aesthetic and MAPS PED, 50% off because of this episode. Half off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Before though we get to that, we should all we should define kind of the history of bodybuilding and 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 what that's based off of. Like, why do we consider those kind of physiques to look good? Why does it look good, or why are we attracted to, or why is it alluring to have a physique like that? I think that's an important discussion. Was Eugene Sandow was he one of the first examples of like like where yes. we started to really pay attention to the overall physique of the strength athlete, not just you know their feats uh, that they were presenting? Yeah. No. Well, you you point to the evolutionary theory around yeah. that that it's really just an exaggerated version of that, right? If a small waist, broad shoulders, uh, low body fat percentage. Uh, is a representation of a healthy person who can reproduce, then when we look at bodybuilding, it's just the exaggerated version of that. Now, we Mm -hmm. know that it's exaggerated so much that it's moved into the unhealthy range, but to the eye, that's what is appealing. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, because shoulder-to-waist ratio can predict testosterone levels, fertility, functionality, performance in men. Um, You, It's an example. It looks healthy. You can get lean and look healthy. You could get too lean and not look healthy, right? You could get muscular and look healthy. You get so muscular, you don't no longer look healthy. Do you think that there, you know, pointing to your evolutionary theory too, do you think that there's even like a, um, protective component too? Like there, is there 
to attract the opposite sex. Totally. You look like you could protect this family, 100%. this your baby. And so ha- seeing this strong, muscular male also isn't just about reproductions, also about you know safety. Of too. course, it's function. Like if you look at some, like if you, if you take the same person, <clears throat> less muscular, higher body fat percentage, more muscular, uh, lower body fat percentage, all within healthy range, and everything else being equal, the more muscular, stronger version is going to be uh, better, better at protecting, better at hunting, providing. And they even show this in the in the in the modern world, right? Modern world, you don't need to throw a spear to catch lunch anymore. You, if you live in a modern society, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably don't need to defend your life on a consistent, regular basis. You probably live in a pretty self safe society. But data shows that when people are more fit, they also earn more money the more successful, they're less likely to be sick. So across the board, um, you know, there's, there's very good reasons to be attracted to this look and kind of seek it out. And, um, you know, I think that's, again, well, yeah, and you, you mentioned them, right? Wide shoulders, small waist. Yeah. Balanced development. This is important. <clears throat> ba- I would say balanced development is probably the most uh, bodybuilding feature of bodybuilding. Yeah. Right? Like all of the strength sports, the way the body's developed is an afterthought, right? Bodybuilding, the you could have the most incredible physique and be the leanest, but if you're out of balance, if your legs don't match your upper body, yeah. or if one side doesn't match the other, or your biceps are out out proportion from your triceps or your chest to your back, you'll lose competition. Which is funny because that's one of the things I think that gym culture and like bodybuilding specifically, like when your legs didn't match your upper body, it stood out so much. Yeah. It's like you're skipping leg day. It's just one of those things. It's noticeably uh, something that's off, and so too to to promote like strength function and actually, um, you know, put those muscles into action, um, you know, having a balanced physique, having muscles that reflect, uh, actual power movement uh, is important. You know, this was something that, that bodybuilding taught me that I didn't see coming was, uh, to your point around symmetry. Uh, and I'll never, and I've shared this before on the podcast and this all came from my, my journey to compete, uh, was when I, I got leaner, um, and, and for the first time in my life, getting the compliments of looking bigger. And I remember my, uh, I, I, for, as a young kid who was insecure about his physique, I was, uh, a lot of that was attached to my arm size. Right. And that was all I trained when I was a, like a teenager, just trying to, I wanted big arms. So one of the first things that I saw shrink down when I got fit or got lean was my arms. And so my, the insecure side of me was like, Oh my God, my arm, I'm getting smaller and smaller. And yet I got these crazy compliments about how much bigger I looked. And I think a lot of that had to do with the proportions of my body started yeah. to, to, they became more symmetrical as I started to compete. And I realized that, oh, wow, like I was allowing my insecurity to drive the, even the way I program and train myself because that's what I thought needed to look better. But in reality, when I was being judged on stage, they want to see balance more than they want to see the biggest arms on stage oh, or yeah. the biggest chest or the biggest mm-hmm. leg. It's like they, that's where they, they you'll get, because almost everybody who gets on stage has got a great physique. Everybody has muscles. Everybody is at, you know, three to 4% body fat range. So that's all the same, but where the, the defines the, the first place guy and the last place guy is the symmetry, the balance and yeah. how well you can look balanced and how, and that's a, a, appealing to the average eye, whether they realize it or not. You just said it, right? A balanced, developed physique will look more impressive to the average person than a physique that is not balanced with an extreme body part or two. And this is, this is kind of, the I wish of I knew goals. that though. Like yeah. I wish someone told me that when I was 17, 18 and I was, you know, again, doing bicep curls five days yeah. a week, yeah. neglecting that, everything else. Yeah. Right? Neglecting yeah. all that. I would have been far better off evenly distributing. That. And I, I know some people say that, but I don't think they really explain to like, that insecure kid that you will actually look better. Like yeah. that would have got to me if you would have said that, right? Like if you would have said like, no, your, your arms, believe it or not, will look better if you did more of your legs. Your chest will look better right. if you did more of your back. Like if they would have communicated that to me, that my overall physique would look more appealing and better if I actually evenly yeah. balanced everything. You know, what's interesting too about this is that symmetry and balance is closely connected to health. So uh, symmetry is very important for beauty. So when they say someone attractive, they can do like a, a, a test and they can find the symmetry of the face. And the more symmetrical the face is, the more beautiful it looks. But they've also connected it to health, the health of someone's DNA, their propensity for chronic disease. Um, in fact, it's so, it's so important for overall health that if you injure one side of your body, if your arm is in a cast and you exercise the other arm, you'll lose less muscle than if you never are in the arm that's in the cast and if you never did anything at all with the other arm. That's how the body communicates with, it, with itself to maintain balance because 
if your strong imbalances reduce function tremendously, regardless how strong your quads are, if the uh, the difference between your quads and hamstrings is so great, you can have the most powerful quads in the world. You'll just tear your hamstrings and hurt yourself when you try to exert force. Nope. So balance is very important. And, you know, without knowing it, bodybuilding, uh, you know, scored balance very highly. And again, it's because it reflects uh, overall health. But the average person through the things that we're going to talk about can definitely achieve a more bodybuilder look to their body with wide shoulders, smaller waist, develop muscles, function, balance, leanness. Like you can definitely do this. Uh, but the first thing, we'll start with the first one. This is the most important. I put this one as number one because uh, developing a physique takes a long time and it takes extreme ridiculous consistency. Mm -hmm. Above all else, it takes extreme consistency. Building muscle takes a long time. Well, I would say this is probably the sport of bodybuilding in general, right? Is, is like how disciplined can you be? And that's outside of, uh, the actual practice in the gym. Like, yes, that's an important part. Uh, the, the training involved too, but it's, it's everything included. It's yes. the diet, it's the nutrition, it's the sleep. It's everything that's fostering the best version of, uh, you know, the, the way to grow and build and develop muscle and have it look a specific way. I know all of my athlete friends hate to hear bodybuilding compared to a sport. Uh, but the truth is I had the opportunity to do both, right? I had the opportunity to play sports and I had the opportunity to uh, compete on bodybuilding. And I will tell you that bodybuilding, one of the hardest things I ever did by far. And the reason why it was, was not because I had to square up against another guy, my size and go head first at each other. And, you know, it took like, I had to work through all this pain right, in a game. And like, it wasn't that it was, you just don't turn it off. You don't have a day off. 24%. You don't have a meal off. And there's, there's not a sport I've ever played where I couldn't let loose and have, you know, eat like crazy and sleep in the next day and not train for a day or two and not come back and compete in my sport at the highest level you know, where with bodybuilding, not only are you unbelievably consistent with your uh, training regimen, but you don't get a meal off. I mean, you have to be dialed like literally yeah. every single yeah. day for every meal for a long period of time, not for a season, not for three months. Like I had to put years, I had to string years to get, to build a competitive physique. Maybe you can get ready for one show and just get, you know, get up on stage uh, and, and say you did it uh, in three months of dieting and training. But if you're going to win at that level, you're going to be good at it, which is what I wanted to do. It took years of competitive consistency around diet and training. And that part of it made it feel like a sport. Well, look, if you take the average man um, who's, let's say, not exercising, works at the office job, or maybe goes to school, doesn't do any strength training and says, hey, I want to look like a bodybuilder, okay? They're probably going to have to add maybe 20 to 25 pounds of lean body mass to their bodies, okay? That takes years. <laughs> That doesn't happen. It doesn't even happen in one consistent year. Mm -hmm. It takes years. Like the first consistent year, you may gain about 12 pounds of lean body mass. Then it falls off a cliff. And then you're lucky to gain three or four pounds a year of lean body mass. So you're talking three, four years, two at the, at the, at the absolute least of absolute dogged consistency. For a female to want to develop a balanced, muscular, lean physique with round glutes and hamstrings, the whole deal, she's probably going to have to gain something like 13 to 17 pounds of lean body mass. For a woman that will take, and I'm talking lean muscle, not water and body fat and all that stuff, like real contractile tissue, takes years and years and years, and it's consistency. That is the one thing with bodybuilders that is different than, like, I, Adam, you said it perfectly, the thing that is the most different about bodybuilders of, of any other athlete or sport or strength sport or anything else is the ridiculous, insane 24 hour day consistency. That's why I put that. And you got to have a lot of faith in and belief in what you've decided is going to be your program and diet because it, in that time, there's going to be a lot of uh, times where you feel like you're not seeing progress. Yeah. And that's psychologically, that's really difficult mm -hmm. to stay the course. When and when the when the plan is to you know shape or sculpt this physique into a winning physique on stage, and you feel like you have st strings of time that you know maybe last week sometimes of looking like you're going backwards or not you know not progressing, and then to still stay the course and be consistent that is really really tough to do, and I think that's where most people 
fall short. I think most people fall short even in their normal pursuit. Forget competing at the highest level and getting on stage. I think it's the same thing that trips up a lot of people and their their weight loss goal is they're they're they got a plan. They're being consistent. Maybe they saw a little bit of change in the beginning. They're excited, and then the excitement wears off, and then they hit a plateau or they don't see change for a week or two. Yet they're putting in all the work still. And that's where most people say F it and they give up and they go no, back the other way. You, you need the longer look it, it because it takes a long time. You have to be more precise and planned, right? Cause if you, if you're off the target by a little bit, I mean, you stretch that out over a year or two, you're going to be way off. So a plan is very important when it comes to uh, what we're talking about. Um, the next point is you have to understand, and you'll hear this a lot in the strength training world, right? Or the fitness world, progressive overload, right? Now, most people think progressive overload just means adding weight to the bar, yep. getting stronger. That is progressive overload. But <clears throat> progressive overload is not just adding weight to the bar. It's adding reps. It's adding sets. It's being able to add intensity. Some exercises with the same sets and same intensity is just going to be more of an overload than other exercises. It's also knowing when to apply more and when to pull back a little bit. The important thing to look at progressive with when it comes to progressive overload is the big picture, though. Right, because uh, the big this is this is how I screwed up a lot in my in the early days of, of my personal training is I thought progressive overload meant every single time I worked out yeah. or every single week I worked out. That's a fast track towards overtraining and injury. And it was always linear. Like, no, it was this like clear path of just like I just keep scaling up, 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 up. No, and no, no. It's literally like um, I can add a little bit now. See how that works. Do I feel good? No, I don't. Back off a little bit. Do it again. And over time, it looks like a step ladder mm -hmm. of progress. But what you should do is over the course of your two or three year journey of this is you can see clearly, okay, I did progressively overload over that period of time. Yeah. I think one of the most important parts of understanding this is, is learning to, is to be able to track your volume and understand your, your, your behaviors around it. Like, so when I, when I got into competing, it was the first time I ever tracked volume. I never tracked volume. I never cared to. I never was that competitive enough to where this makes sense. Obviously, if I'm in the sport of improving my physique month over month, show over show, uh, okay, this makes sense that I'm going to really get into this. And the, the thing that was most glaring to me was just like when I do nutrition, I don't like go right into like, here's the plan of how I'm going to progressively over. I'm like, let's just track. Let's see what my normal habits are and what I do. And what I found is that, and which I've found this in my clients afterwards is that we, we all kind of have this natural ebb and flow with our life of, of over progressive overload or volume is you're, you're feeling good. You're sleeping good. You're, you're, you're hitting things and you're, and you're like slowly, you know, adding weight to the bar, adding sets or reps in all these different ways of progressive overloading. And then the inevitable happens where you kind of fall off or you get busy or you miss a workout here or there. And when you pull back, what I would, what I found out was like, oh wow, I'm pretty much doing the same amount as what I was three months ago. I just, it just, but it felt like in my head because I had you're those, counting those hard. That's right, I'm those counting those hard. sprints. I had those moments where like, oh no, I know I ramped that intensity yeah. up, or I, I knew I hit a PR, but then when I pulled back and looked at it, I was like, oh wow, your body has this really interesting thing how it just kind of naturally gravitates to homeostasis or what's normal for you, and you really have to be uh, mindful. If you want to methodically do this, you know, month over month or, you know, a year over year or whatever, and have that approach. And so the rule that I kind of had when I was doing this was that just don't go back at them. Like, let's track volume. Let's base off how you feel, like you were saying. So as I would come into a new week, I knew what I did volume wise the previous week. And then this week, it was just like, don't go backwards. And if you can, let's inch forward a little bit. And I just kind of had that mindset every mm -hmm. single week. And then when I would pull back over a month or two months, there would be this natural progressive overload that time. Yeah. The, the two mistakes I made with progressive overload were uh, as follows. The first one was not realizing that higher rep sets, even though the weight was lighter, would typically add up to far more volume. Yeah. So for example, if I did 20 reps with 200 pounds on the bar, that's going to be more volume than three reps with 350 pounds on the bar. Even though I'm lifting way more weight, the volume is so much higher. So the, the, the way you calculate volume, and for the most part within reason, this works. Because if you go extreme, then yeah, it doesn't work. Someone could say, well, if I did, what if I did five pounds for 10,000 reps or something? Like, okay, we're talking within reason, within what would be considered the rep ranges for bodybuilding, which is between, let's say, one to 25, right? You go sets times reps times weight. 
and that's your total volume. And when I didn't do that, what I would do is count sets. I didn't look at anything else. Mm. I looked at the weight on the bars if I was getting stronger, but it was about sets. So I said, well, I'm doing the same volume as I did last week. I'm still doing 12 sets for shoulders. Last week I did 12 sets for shoulders. Why do I feel so fried? Well, it's because now I went lighter, but did so many more reps that the volume went through the roof. I didn't count it because the weight was lighter. Yeah. That's not how volume works. It's sets times reps uh, times weight. The second mistake I would make is when I would progressively overload, and this is a huge mistake. Nobody, no, A lot of people don't understand this, is I would increase the volume on everything at the same time. I'm going to do two more sets for every body part. Yeah. Rather than oh. adding a little bit of volume in one area and leaving it alone. Yeah. All of it taxes the body. So mm -hmm. I can't. you can't go into your workout and progressively over. That's like way too much all at once. In fact, oftentimes when bringing up a weak body part, if your body's not ready to add more volume, then all you do is take volume away from another body part and add it to the body part you're looking to build up. That's Those are the biggest mistakes I made with- uh, That's why I felt like the what I had pieced together from this tracking and going through this process totally. was like, just don't go backwards, Adam. Make sure you accomplish what you did the previous week. And then if you felt good, let's strike, yeah. let's take a little bit, a step forward in an area. And I, I typically would pick areas that I was trying to develop, right? I'd be running something like maps aesthetic. I'd be trying to develop one or two different body parts. And so that's where I would add a little bit of that volume. I would just focus on that area and I would only do it when I felt good, when mm -hmm. I felt like, okay, I, my body can handle more. Okay. And then, and then not make the mistake of overreaching, right? Cause that's the other thing that we do is just like, oh, I feel good. So then you train everything to failure that day at the workout, or you add like five more sets. It's like, dude, you just need to go up a little bit, a little bit more in weight, a little bit more in volume. And that could be weight. It could be reps. It could be sets. Not all at once. Yeah. Just, Cause I would do the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Add a set or two plus add weight, way too much all at once. Yeah. yeah. So the next one too, I mean, this one for me, uh, I, I never really cared too much about like how presenting my physique and, and, you know, getting to the point where I'm like, you know, pumped up and juiced up after walking outside the gym, but I was always, you know, trying to get stronger and always focused on what's going to move the needle the most in terms of like, what are the big lifts in here that can accomplish that? And it can, you know, really take me to a new level. And I was already doing them. I was already deadlifting. I was already squatting. I was already bench pressing. And it was really as simple as that. And I think yeah. we overcomplicate this part so much and don't realize that those lifts specifically build the most muscle, oh, yeah. gives you the most to work with to, to then, you know, fine tune down the road. Period. End of story. Like at the end of the day, uh, That's your muscle, foundation. it's strength. If you yeah. get stronger, you'll build muscle, especially the first, you know, three years of your training. Like this should be the most important thing. If you get stronger, you will build more muscle. Strength is extremely important to developing a physique that looks like a bodybuilder. And then you name some exercises, Justin. There's a lot of bodybuilding exercises that are out there. And because bodybuilding at the high levels is all about fine tuning the physique, you have a million and one different exercises for every body part. But the big movers, the compound lifts for, you know, if you're doing this and, and you're, you're getting going and you want to develop that physique, like, you know, a barbell squat is going to do more than the, the next four exercises combined. So you want to focus on those big gross motor movements and you want to get stronger at them. This is the foundation, and it always has been, of mm -hmm. bodybuilding. There's a lot of parts of bodybuilding, but strength is the foundation. This is why, if you look back at the, the journey of getting into competing, there was a year that I spent of training before I even entered into my first show. In that year's time, I was cycling through MAPS Anabolic. Mm. And the goal was purely, I'm going to get strong at these major lifts. Just get strong and lay that foundation. It wasn't until I got into competing did I do MAPS Aesthetic and like a PED type of layout like we have those. But that didn't come till later. It was yeah. first you follow an anabolic type of protocol like that, build the most amount of strength I can and these big lifts. And that was actually unique there in my in the bodybuilding space. That's most people jump right to the mm -hmm. yep. the yeah. pump and sculpting part. And they don't lay that foundation. They don't squat, they don't deadlift, they don't do these big gross motor move compound lifts. They're doing all these isolation exercises and pumping exercises and supersets. And I'm just like, man, that is not just what's gonna limit move the, your potential. Yeah, it's just not gonna move the needle the, the most. The most the, the thing that's gonna move the needle the most is building that strength in those lifts. And so that should be the foundation. If anybody, even if you're not going to get on stage, if you're looking to build a better physique, that should be the foundation. And then we get to the sculpting type stuff later yeah, on. Yes, so which brings us to the next one, which is the pump. Now, what's interesting, now this is also, I would say, so the first most unique thing about a bodybuilding is this kind of, you know, presentation, right? This balanced looking physique. But the other unique thing about bodybuilding is the only strength sport that values the 
side effect of strength training during the workout, which is the pump. Yeah. No other strength sport <laughs> looks at the pump and says that was great. They that avoid it for the most part. In fact, yeah. it's a hundred percent. There, you know, power lifters could care less about the pump. Olympic lifters definitely don't care about the pump. Shot putters, mm -hmm. like you know, rock climbers, rock climbers. Like, any strength sport, like the pump is like this side effect. Well, in bodybuilding, it becomes one of the main effects. Now, what's cool about this is that there's two reasons why the pump is valuable. One, clearly does signal muscle growth. Two, the environment that creates the best pump is probably the environment that builds the most muscle. In other words, not, do, not only does the pump signal your body to build muscle because of the pump itself, right? More blood and nutrients getting into the muscle that can come out. There's a little bit of a waist buildup. That signals muscle growth. There's some cell uh, swelling that happens. So that's also important. But it also is telling you that, oh, I got a good pump. I'm probably well hydrated. I'm probably well fed. I'm not overtrained. So it's also telling me that mm, I'm in a good environment to build muscle. And then there's a third aspect that bodybuilders really took advantage of with the pump, which is you can see what your body looks like when you pump a muscle and, and make it look more developed temporarily. Bodybuilders took advantage of this, right? So if they had a weak body part or they wanted to see what they would look like, if they got their rear delts a little bit more developed or their upper chest, chest a little bit more developed, they would go get a pump, look in the mirror, and now you can look and see like, okay, I can see my potential. Yeah, yeah. I can see where I'm going because uh, because I got this muscle to temporarily look bigger. It's also a clear indication if you can't get a certain muscle group a good pump, like You're where not there's a loss of yeah, connection. There's a loss of a mind muscle connection there. And so, you know, in, in terms of like developing and building this uh, aesthetic physique that's balanced, you know, that's that's also like a consideration as you're doing the pump style train hypertrophy uh, to be able to see whether or not, you know, you're getting that clear signal back that we got that. Bro, pump. That, that's so important you said that. If you do pull-ups and you feel no pump in your back and you get a great pump in your biceps, we well, got to change the way you're doing pull-ups. Right. Yeah. That is signaling to you that you're connecting maybe more to your arms than you should be. Now, if you just want to do a lot of pull-ups, maybe it doesn't make a big difference. But if you want to develop your back from doing pull-ups, then it, it's actually important for you to pay attention to. The other thing too, is, and I, I noticed with, with clients, that when I was training clients and we were working on specific areas and body parts, especially when they first got started, the, as soon as they, were, they would tell me, oh, my muscles feel really tight, or I feel my glutes get really pumped, or I can feel my lats, I never felt that before, I knew muscle growth was on the other end. Right. It was always like, once we got the pump, the rest started to kind of accelerate. Yeah, and I think that has a lot to do with what you just said, is that they, they're they now learning how to truly activate that muscle. Yeah. It's funny that we're, we're talking about this within the in the bodybuilding world, but I mean, I, I use this with the general population all the time. Right? All the time. Because one of the hardest things to get clients to do, and you use the back as an example, it's a great example, like how many clients did you have that actually could get a back pump? Yeah, a lot of clients few. couldn't do it. A lot of, and, and a lot of that is because they're pooling with their arms all the time to do any of the exercises, whether it's a row, I, whether it's a pull up, it didn't matter. They would do it all with their shoulders rolled forward and with all with their biceps and they would never, and then those are smaller muscles. So they would fatigue first before the back even got fatigued mm -hmm. and they never got sore, never got a pump there. And so teaching the general pop how to just get a pump in those areas is a great way to help work on that mind muscle connection, which supports no matter what your goal is. Totally. Um, lastly, we've talked about this uh, earlier in the episode, but that's to make your training balanced. So that's a key with bodybuilding. And, and this is to really get an aesthetic looking physique. You want a lot of balance. Again, if you have a very, very developed muscular upper body, but your lower body is totally out of proportion. Like, you know, if you stand there in some shorts or whatever, you go to the beach, like you're not going to look as good as someone who doesn't have nearly as developed an upper body who looks a lot more balanced. Balanced training is key to bodybuilding. Now, what does this look like? Well, you could, and, and, and I don't think I need to say this because I think people kind of get this, but you look at your body, you see how it's developed and you know where you need to place your focus. And what you do with this is you either increase the volume uh, or, or, you know, the, the reps or the sets on that particular area, or what most people need to do is take away volume from areas that they already develop very quickly and lend it to these other body parts. A lot of people have an issue with that. Like you tell somebody who's got really well developed triceps, but their biceps are very undeveloped. And you say, they'll, they'll, they'll say, oh yeah, I could work more bicep. But if you say, no, 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 take some volume from your tricep and move it to your bicep. They'll, oh no, 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 I don't want to do that. So, well, you're not gonna be able to develop balance if you keep that, that ratio up. You know, we, we tend to communicate most of our stuff to like general pop, because I think that's who listens to the show, but we do have a, a, a a small portion of people in here that are competitive uh, bodybuilders, men's physique, bikini athletes. And 
this uh, maps aesthetic is something that I'm like extremely proud that we did. And we don't talk a lot about that. We talk a lot about prime and prime pro, which of course those are correctional things. That's mm -hmm. general population that helps out the most. I mean, it helps everybody out, but that's who that's for more than anybody. But maps aesthetic to me is it, it, it takes what you're explaining right now on how do I go about making a symmetrical physique and actually lays that out and tells you how to do it that. allows you to plug it in. Yeah. None which, of our programs do that. And I don't, I don't, I've never seen anything else out there like that. Like, no, I'd never seen it. And yet that's exactly how I had to program as I was getting ready for each show, because you go to a show and whether I could see it or not, a judge would tell me, they'd say, Hey, your you know, your shoulders are underdeveloped compared to your chest or your, your back is overdeveloped compared to your hamstring. They'll tell you like where you're strong and where you're weak. And so I would take that information instead of being, you know, insecure about it or, Oh, poor me. I would go back and go like, okay. He says, my, my back is plenty developed. So I'm going to pull back on the volume a little bit there. He says, my shoulders are underdeveloped. So I'm going to, I'm going to ramp up mm -hmm. the volume there. Okay. And then I'd have to program it in. And so this, when we did maps aesthetic, that was the idea was, okay, how do we do this? But then we also customize it. So the individual can choose their areas that they want to develop and plug it into the program and then follow it. And then at the end of it, they should see this, their body more balanced than what it was. And that's, that, yeah, that's, that's exactly how you want to train when you're trying to bring up balance. You know, we do also have some really hardcore listeners, like people who really dedicate a lot of time to training yeah, and who already train at a, a high volume. And the question I get from those people is, uh, okay, how do I increase it? Like my workout's already an hour and a half long. Like, okay, I guess I can do another 20 minutes. Like, what does that look like? Well, bodybuilders figured this out a long time ago with a, what's called a double split routine. This is where you train twice a day. So instead of doing your one hour, 45 minute workout once a day, because what happens at the end of, you know, after the first hour, hour and 20 minutes, fatigue sets in and what you train at the end doesn't get the same uh, attention or the same stimulus as the stuff you train in the beginning. So bodybuilders in the past, and this was, this was pioneered in the sixties, but really in the seventies became popular with the bodybuilders like Arnold and, and, and those uh, during the golden era, what they call what they would go and they would train twice a day because they'd come back fresh and do what's called a double split. And this allowed the body to somewhat recover in between workouts. It also allowed the body to handle more volume. So I'm going to give this example right now because there's a lot of studies that show that volume versus volume, it's all the same, but at some point that's not true. If you took, you know, a tremendous amount, let me, I'm going to make it extreme, right? You look at, uh, let's say somebody does uh, 50 sets of exercises in a week. You take one person and they do 50 sets on Monday. The other person does 50 sets and spreads it out Monday through Sunday. The person that spreads it out is going to get better results. Okay. Mm. And the more volume you do, the more mm. uh, of a discrepancy there is with that. So if you're training at high volume and you want to progressively overload and add even more volume, you need to split your workouts up because at some point it becomes detrimental to put them all in one workout. And we have a program called MAPS PED that's that exactly. It's a very high volume, very high frequency, like progressively overloaded to the extreme. This is our most advanced program. Most advanced. Yeah. And that's exactly what we did is we put we made a double split routine so that we don't run into that problem. I mean, I feel like this is uh the nitrous of of like training programs for right. for me. So if I was laying out like a year of my training for a show, it would look like MAPS anabolic maps aesthetic and then PED. And if anything, I would interrupt uh one of those three with something like symmetry or performance. But like if I were like to map out yeah. yeah a year of what getting ready for a show or or the ultimate like pathway of to build the best physique, it would obviously be the strength foundation like we talked about earlier, why that that's the first found like you got to pursue that first, whether you're doing it already or you or you're about to anabolic first then you would move into aesthetic and then you would move into the high. And, the, and what's beautiful about that is each one of those is programmed to progressively overload for you. You just follow it to a T and then we've built in the overload there. And then the only other option that I would add in there is, and this would be based off the client on how their joints are feeling, how their progress is going. So long as everything is going good, then we follow that pathway. If I find there's any sort of imbalance, if I find that they're they're complaining of achy joints, things like that, then I would throw in something like you know a symmetry or a performance to interrupt those three. Totally, that's the idea. Totally. Pathway. So here's what we're gonna do: Maps Aesthetic, Maps PED. Those are our bodybuilding programs. They're both fifty percent off for this episode. You can find them at MapsFitnessProducts.com, but you have to use the code Bodybuilder to get that discount. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump DeStefano. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.